on the last talk about endothelial cells, especially in Fuchs dystrophy, I think this ties into my talk very well. We'll go into a little bit of uh, basics about Fuchs dystrophy before we get into some of the uh, more detailed discussion about it uh, in this 10 minute presentation. Uh, the demographics of Fuchs uh, really are that it's about 4% population prevalence uh, throughout the world. It's globally prevalent. Uh, there are regional variances, which we'll get into in, in a short while. Uh, most commonly it's seen in patients over the age of 40, uh, though there is an earlier onset variant with a slightly different genetic profile. Uh, there are more females affected than males. And a very interesting study that came out of Harvard just a few months ago uh, looked at why this may be. And the theory that was proposed was that perhaps uh, ultraviolet light affects eyes differently in females and in males. Uh, interesting study for those of us uh, who, are, uh, who are inclined to read more, the, the citation is below. Uh, this is the most common corneal dystrophy requiring transplantation globally. Symptoms, of course, are decreased vision, but more importantly, we see glare and decreased contrast sensitivity. We looked at variables uh, requiring um, uh, you know, endothelial transplantation in patients with low cell counts, but one thing we don't often realize is that patients are often affected at earlier stages than we give it credit for, just because of the prevalence of gutti in the center of the cornea, which really affect their vision. So in some cases, we are moving to surgery at an earlier stage, especially with the advances in surgery, uh, that DMEC can afford with a faster recovery and the potential of extremely good vision recovery. There are often fluctuations in vision, and this can be some of the most troublesome uh, signs early on in the course of the disease, with patients work, waking up with worse vision due to the decreased surface evaporation that occurs while their eyes are closed during sleep. And of course, in the more advanced stages, you can have pain due to ruptured, ruptured bullae from swelling in the corneal epithelium. Um, this has been localized uh, in most patients to chromosome 18, and what's been discovered is uh, expansions of the transcription factor 4, or TCF4 uh, gene. Uh, in particular, uh, the intron CTG uh, repeats anywhere from 10 to 2,600 times in patients. Most commonly, it's seen in repeats of over 50. This is a very interesting finding and one that's been studied uh, quite a bit. Uh, and one interesting notation, uh, I had the benefit of working with our neurology colleagues at Methodist and looking at uh, muscular dystrophy type 1 patients who also have a similar CTG repeat in a different gene. And there was some uh, studies performed uh, uh, elsewhere as well, looking at the correlation perhaps in systemic CTG repeats in other genes versus those in patients who have it in the cornea. So I think there's a lot of interesting developments in this, in this field. We see that uh, these repeats can occur globally, uh, and it's actually quite significant in Chinese populations and a significant association in Indian populations as well. Uh, one study suggested that perhaps the Japanese population had a weaker association, um, uh, but uh, it is prevalent, prevalent globally. Um, we also, as I mentioned earlier, there's an earlier onset variant, which uh, appears to be due to a different gene The clinical presentation, as we've discussed um, quite a bit, is uh, that you <clears throat> have corneal gutti, which are collagen excrescences in decimase membrane, and this is a classic beaten metal appearance that occurs on the posterior cornea. They start centrally uh, and spread towards the periphery, and the same study that I referred to earlier also looked at a mouse model where perhaps ultraviolet light exposure, which is obviously prevalent in the palpebral fissure and in the center of the cornea, may be a reason why there are a genetic alterations in the central endothelium in these patients first. Uh, gutty can be seen in other conditions. 11% uh, of people over the age of 50 in one study do have gutty. Um, and these are seen in other conditions, as we've mentioned, in uveitis uh, and deposits from other conditions as well. These are pathologically identical to Hassel-Henley bodies, which are in the periphery and are a benign variant. We also see, as, as has been des described quite nicely in the previous presentations, thickening of decimase membrane with deposition of collagen and extracellular matrix. But we can also see that there's increased pigmentation. So it, it sometimes looks like there are pigmented and non-pigmented gutty. And of course, with prolonged um, uh, disease, we have corneal edema, which can then actually lead to stromal haze and subepithelial fibrosis when it's quite prolonged such that we have some patients who, uh, when they present with advanced disease, may not be the best candidates for just endothelial keratoplasty if they've had significant corneal stromal uh, scarring. 
And then as was discussed earlier, polymegathism and pleomorphism can be seen on specular microscopy. And these, I agree with the prior uh, presentations and discussion uh, with Dr. Titiel, uh, suggesting that these are quite important variables in terms of uh, trying to assess a patient's recovery from any sort of surgery, including cataract surgery. The higher the coefficient of variability and, um, and other variables like that can affect uh, recovery. Uh, if we look at the grading scales, there are various ways of grading uh, um, uh, corneal, uh, sorry, uh, Fuchs dystrophy. We have the original Kratchmer scale from 1978, which essentially includes six different grades. And this has been modified to a different grading scale. Instead of zero to four plus, we can just call it one through six, which I find a little bit easier. We'll discuss this in more detail in a second, but you can also see that there are other grading scales such as the one below here from the Academy of Ophthalmology, looking at um, uh, not just the original six grading scales and compressing them into perhaps the first three, but adding a fourth one, which I was discussing, which occurs in very advanced stages when you have subepithelial fibrosis and dense opacity in the cornea with uh, severe disease in the stroma as well. Now, Looking at some of these cases, let's take grade one, where you have just less than 12 scattered non-confluent uh, gutty that you can see here. And these were described in the first cohort of patients described back in 1978 by Kratchmer. Moving on, you can have more than 12, but still non-confluent and really not clinically relevant to the patient at this stage. Once you start getting a more confluent pattern, especially in the uh, central one to two millimeters, you can grade this as grade three and then expanding to a further diameter in the central cornea, two to five millimeter diameter would be considered grade four. And again, you have a confluent pattern. And I believe this is where you start seeing clinical um, uh, signs, uh, uh, clinical symptoms, uh, perhaps even at grade three, where you start having a little bit of uh, uh, contrast sensitivity loss and glare in patients. And of course, grade five with a larger diameter, greater than five millimeters of corneal involvement. And then grade six, where you can see stromal and epithelial edema. And this patient of mine, you can just see a little bit of edema off to the right of the slit beam, which is very subtle, but definitely leads it to a higher grading scale. And of course, a more advanced pattern of edema, as you can see here, which is quite obvious and not easy to miss. We talked about the traditional risk factors in Dr. Sunitha's talk for decompensation. And we can review that here, endothelial cell count less than 600 or pachymetry of greater than 640 microns or the presence of any edema. However, we know again that uh, sometimes these traditional risk factors are not very meaningful. For example, endothelial cell count, as was discussed nicely, uh, can be limited, especially centrally when there are significant gutty. And of course, we know that the pachymetry in patients can vary dramatically. Um, if you don't have the baseline pachymetry, you really can't comment on whether a pachymetry is abnormal for a patient or not. So one recommendation that was suggested was looking at corneal tomography and Scheinplug imaging. And this is a great study that uh, Dr. Patel from Mayo Clinic has been uh, talking about. This is again, looking at Scheinplug tomography risk factors for five-year significant progression of Fuchs. And he brought it down to three important factors, two of which were significant on multivariate analysis. The first one was loss of regular isopacs, as you can see on the bottom right image here, you don't have a regular uh, pachymetry pattern in the cornea. So where you have irregularity, that leads to a higher risk for progression. Uh, second is displacement of the thinnest point of the cornea, uh, which uh, as you can see also um, in the bottom left image, uh, relates to uh, uh, the higher risk for Fuchs, because as we know, the thinnest point of the cornea generally should be in the center. And then finally, the focal posterior depression, even though this was not significant on multivariate analysis, it's really tied into factor number two. And you can see that on the bottom right image. And I consider that to be very helpful as well, where you have, uh, instead of um, uh, elevation in the cornea and the posterior surface, you actually have depression. So it actually pushes back with a negative finding on tomography measurements. As you can see from patients of mine here, we have a, a patient with quite thick cornea here, as you can see from a Galilei dual Scheinflug imaging, corneal pachymetry was 587 centrally. However, there were pretty regular patterns of posterior elevation on the bottom right image and um, uh, on the bottom right of the left image. Um, and, um, and then also the pachymetry map, which is the top right image on the left hand of the screen shows that there are actually pretty uh, concentric rings of pachymetry with fairly central location of the center of, uh, of the central thinning portion. One thing I look at in the Galilei as well, which I found to be helpful is total corneal wavefront. And that's the very bottom right image 
where you can see 0.5 microns of root mean square corneal um, wavefront aberrometry. And I think this is one thing that we can highlight. We're gonna see more aberrations in these corneas. And that's what I like about this imaging. Whereas if you go to this next patient, the central pachymetry is actually only 490 microns. This patient must have started out with a very thin cornea and this is not a post-refractive case either. But you can see in the left-sided images on the bottom right of those images, you can see that the posterior elevation is a little bit atypical where you have a depression on the right. You can also see in the upper image just above that, that you have a little bit of nasal displacement, sorry, temporal displacement of the thinnest pachymetry. And then if you look at the corneal wavefront, you see an RMS of 0.64 microns. And if you note carefully, you see a significant increase in horizontal coma with a slight increase in vertical coma. And again, this is due to the pattern of edema and the irregular isopax, especially horizontally in this patient. So I think these are factors that we can look at as we dive into details into the shape changes in the cornea from early, early Fuchs uh, disease. Moving forward, um, cornea guttata is the strongest association with progression to post phaco, um, uh, sorry, the, from the progression post phaco to transplantation for any cause. So again, cornea guttata is very significant. Fuchs is again, the most common cause of corneal transplantation worldwide. In the US, we see that as well, where 36% of the almost 47,000 transplants performed in 2016 were for Fuchs. But if we look at the India data, we can see that the most common cause is actually for infectious keratitis. This is for all transplantation. If we divide it up into endothelial keratoplasty, we don't have national data for India. But if you look at two centers, prominent centers, Adisha Eye Hospital, where Dr. Basak presented 600 eyes just last month, um, showed that 43% uh, were for pseudophagic bullous keratopathy or post-cataract corneal edema, and 36% or a decreased number were due to Fuchs. Uh, and when I spent time with uh, their clinic um, a few years ago, uh, it reminded me that a lot of the post uh, corneal edema from cataract surgery is related to uh, contaminants from some of the products that are used intracamerally during surgery due to unregulated um, products sometimes being used. Uh, and if you look at Dr. Shroff's data, um, uh, 261 eyes over a two year period, we can see that a far, uh, even a larger majority were for pseudophagic bullous keratopathy with a smaller amount for Fuchs. So again, the distribution is maybe slightly different, but we do see Fuchs present globally everywhere. And um, uh, certainly globally, the leading cause of corneal transplantation. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out in this slide, this is a, a, a nice a summary of uh, global transplants in 2012. You can see that behind the US, India had the heart li largest amount of transplantations uh, nationally uh, around the world after the US. So definitely a, a large rate of transplantation. However, if you look at per capita, it is very small. And again, that's because of the population of India being so large. Uh, and then once again, this is a nice pictorial of the differences in the reasons for transplantation globally. Once again, US, it's really Fuchs dystrophy. Uh, many parts of the world, it's keratoconus. And of course, in India and some of the South, uh, uh, South Asian, Southeast Asian countries, still infectious keratopathy for global transplantation if you include PKP and endothelial keratoplasty. And finally, I won't go into surgical management because that's gonna be in one of the upcoming talks, but we see that we have great surgeries now that avoid penet penetrating keratoplasty such as DSEC and DMEC, which afford a faster recovery with lower rates of rejection. And of course, DMEC uh, being a slightly newer version than DSEC, with less rejection seen in DMEC eyes, and of course, less refractive changes due to less thickening added to the cornea in DMEC eyes. And happy to take any questions, but thank you for your attention.